I don't know if this is the right place for this, but I need to put these stories out there just so people have a record of what's going on here, in case something ever does happen to me. I work as a sleep analyst at a special clinic located in a place I don't feel comfortable enough to disclose. Um, my job is essentially to watch people whilst they're sleeping and determine the cause of their insomnia, the sleep apnea, usually run-of-the-mill problems. Doctors refer their patients to us before they hand them medication, so they can have a more thorough idea of their issues. By and large, my job's okay. Pays well. While to most places in the country, sleep analysts aren't required to watch live footage of their patients, our clinic requires sleep analysts to do this as part of the policy, and patients always have to stay overnight for the analysis to be completed correctly. This would be alright if things didn't get specifically strange around here at night. When I first started working here, I got assigned a lot of the midnight shifts. I'm pretty nocturnal, so I didn't mind this at all. Mostly I used to sit in the observation room and watch the screen. And when it seemed like the person was in deep sleep, I'd just listen to their breathing patterns for changes whilst reading a book. When I'd get up to go to the toilet, though, an uneasy feeling would settle in my gut. It always felt as though someone was watching me in that long corridor between the observation room and the bathroom. I kept writing it off as nerves until I started seeing something in the corner of my eye. It would just disappear the moment I look at it. It's like the shadow of a person, but there was no... shadow. I mentioned it to one of my co-workers when I was handing over the next shift to him, and he just got really uneasy and said not to acknowledge it. When I pushed him further, he dropped his voice to a whisper and said... It gets really angry when you talk about it. He refused to say any more. A week later, he quit. I never saw him again. No one really talks to him anymore. It's almost like he never existed. I think his name was Daniel. But I can't be so sure. Every few months, and for no reason, all the patients sit up in bed at once. Their eyes are wide open, and they're staring at something in the right corner of the room, mouthing words, but not actually making a sound. It looks like they're talking to someone, but they can't be because nothing's in there with them. The first time I saw this, I panicked and called my boss, and was really surprised to hear her say, groggily, as she only worked the day shift, just erase that part of the video when it's over. I tried to protest, but just do it. And don't wake them up or, or mention it to them in the morning. My colleagues say that they're sleep-talking. But I've never seen sleep-talking like that, as a collective in different secluded rooms with eyes wide open, looking like they're bulging in fear. I tried reporting it to my boss's boss, but got no response. My boss must have heard about it, though, because she gave me a verbal warning for disobeying her and going behind her back. One time at around 3 in the morning on Wednesday, we started hearing hammering and scratching on the clinic's door. A weird wailing shriek joined it. Every time one of the three of us would answer, that is me, the security guard, or the sleep tech, there'd be no one there. Sure, it could be some kids playing a prank, but the clinic was located close to a secluded forest. The nearest town is miles and miles away. They'd have to get to us by car. There's limited parking areas around here. We didn't see a car in any of them. And we went out with flashlights to look twice. We all thought it was maybe the wind, as it was particularly windy that night. We all just let it go. It carried on till early morning. And when we got ready to hand over the shift, our colleagues, Sally and James, came in looking perplexed. Instead of answering us, they just told us to go and see what happened to the front door. It looked like someone, or something, had been trying its damnedest to get in. There were these... These bloody scratches all the way down the thick wood. Scratches that looked far too wide for any bear or wolf. Any kind of wild animal. Scratches that certainly didn't look human. We keep cats in the clinic to soothe people. We have five of them, and generally just let anxious patients stroke them to soothe themselves before going to sleep. These cats have been raised from an early age to cope well with strangers, so... Calm and generally very friendly in nature, uh, Sammy, the cuddly little tabby, is the friendliest and favorite amongst everyone. 
Recently, he's been hissing more frequently, though, but only at certain patients. He refuses to go near them. Strangely, those people are always the ones who complain of night terrors. The kind where they accidentally scratch or bruise themselves. I'm sure it's just a coincidence, but it's weird. You know? How he always seems to know. The last one, for now, is about what I found in one of the rooms no staff other than the bosses are allowed to access. You see, the clinic isn't a new building. It used to be a hospital once upon a time, before it fell into disuse and disrepair after the owners died. The kin didn't take any real interest in running it, and people started going to the newer, swankier hospitals that were built in their own towns. It's at least a couple hundred years old, and even though it's been renovated and looks brand new, there are certain parts of the building we aren't allowed to go into because they're just, um, still being done up. They're labeled private and have authorized access only across the front. A few days ago, I lost my way trying to find the new staff room that they had just renovated for us and found myself in an older, carpeted corridor, staring at stairs that led up to a red door, which was just a jar, light pouring out from inside. Thinking this was a staff room, I took the stairs, two at a time, wanting to get out of the dark. When I pushed open the door, I found a single armchair in the center of the room, wooden floors and a massive floor-to-ceiling window behind it. The light came from a crystal chandelier. The whole room looked like time had forgotten it. It was so different to the clinic, which was all white and medical and still smelled of fresh paint. It was also slightly creepy how there was no other furniture in here, just a single red and gold ornate armchair. A pile of black files lay on top. The first one opened. My curiosity got the better of me. I picked up the open file and I began to read. It paled almost immediately. Across the front of the file, it stated clearly deceased. As of today that I had never heard of this patient before. His name was Charles Islington. He was part of an experiment on night twitches, the thing that happens when you and your whole body jerks and no one really knows why. I hadn't even known we were conducting something like this, and all the staff were supposed to have equal knowledge of everything that happens within the clinic. I got as far as reading, patient appears to be convulsing after second induced jerk when I heard a soft scraping sound behind me. My heart stopped. I dropped the file, slowly turning around, and there was... There was nothing there. Suddenly, the chandelier began to flicker, and I swear to God, I saw something, something, move in between the flickering. Edging closer to me, it looked like a, like a figure, but I couldn't make out its face. All I know is that it was reaching for me. It wasn't a human hand. It couldn't be. It was too twisted and gnarled and pale, and the fingernails were just... They weren't right, but I couldn't, I couldn't even tell if it was what I was seeing in my eyes was so affected by the light. Instead, I ran, almost blinded by the flickering in the direction of the door. I kept running down the stairs until I reached the corridor to the observation room and then walked to the observation room and shut the door, locking it for good measure. The rest of the night passed uneventfully, but I took the next night off because I was still slightly shaken. I live alone in an apartment in a busy neighborhood in town about 30 miles away from the clinic, and usually I feel really safe here. My little studio has always been my refuge, and coming home has been a welcome respite. Ever since that night, though, I feel like, like something's watching me, like, like something's angry. It's followed me back from the clinic. And see it shifting, moving slowly, carefully, like it's waiting to devour me. I, I think I haven't seen it yet. I think that's what's keeping me safe. But I know it's there. It's watching me right now as I type this, waiting in the corner. my eye. Okay, I'm incredibly scared and frustrated. I don't know what to do, but I'm hoping my story can save someone. 
I've always loved food. Maybe even too much sometimes. I'm, I'm by no means overweight. I actually think of myself as quite average. I suppose every girl wants to be a bit thinner, right? However, a couple of weeks ago, I began to notice a change in my appetite. The problem is that I work as a chef, so tasting food and eating is a part of my job description. That day at work, I just didn't feel like eating. Not necessarily like an aversion to food yet, but just a meh feeling towards it. I decided to just trust my cooking abilities that night. Service went well, we cleaned, and I went home. The next day, I woke up to make the usual omelet I always make. Three eggs, a little tomato, a bit of chopped onion, and some cilantro. Making omelets to me is like an art. When I finished, I sat down to eat it, but something in me just wouldn't let me start eating it. I had to force myself to eat every beautiful bite. I knew it was delicious, but I somehow felt very reluctant. I went to start my usual daily chores, but I must have overdid it at breakfast <laughs> because I spent the rest of the day puking my guts out. I even had to call into work. They weren't happy about that. But I didn't want to tell them I was puking either. I mean, it's not exactly what you want to hear from a chef, right? I thought maybe I just had one of those 24-hour bugs. I told my work I was sorry about yesterday, but was ready to go in now. I know it's probably super wrong that I went into work because I might have been sick. But at that time, I didn't really think much of it, and I, I can't afford to miss too many days of work. My boss would probably fire me. That day at work was horrible. Everything that I tried to taste was just so bland. No matter how much seasoning I added, it still tasted so bland to me. What's strange is that multiple people complained of over-seasoning. When I tasted the return plates, it still tasted bland to me. I, I mean, I was baffled. I tried to ignore my taste buds. I told my sous chef he'd have to taste the dishes that I smoked earlier, and that it might have whacked out my taste buds. I think he knows that was a lie. Probably because I don't even smoke. Because he just stared back at me with eyes that said, Are you okay? I just gave him an awkward smile as if to respond, Yes, I am, I promise. I knew the next day was my day off, so I just thought to myself, Get through this service and you can spend all of tomorrow relaxing. So I pushed through service, we got it done, and with no further complaints, <laughs> as far as over-seasoning or blandness were concerned. That night I got home and sat on the couch, angry at myself and the situation. I didn't feel sick, so I wasn't sure what was going on with my taste buds. I felt perfectly fine, despite the fact that I hadn't eaten much. I stopped to think about it and realized I hadn't really had a meal since the omelet if that even counted. I opened my fridge for what felt like an hour, trying to think of anything I could eat. I mean, everything seemed appetizing. I always kept a well-stocked fridge of fresh vegetables, butter, eggs, and, you know, any other chef delights, but nothing really tickled my fancy. I closed the fridge and sat on the floor feeling angry about my appetite. My palate was a necessary tool, not being able to taste and being a chef is its like having no limbs and being in construction. After all, it was my absolute sense of taste that got me to such a high position so quickly. I could tell freshness, where something was from, how it was prepared, all from just my mouth. I, mean, I don't mean to brag, but it's quite an extraordinary ability in my opinion. And I'm glad it's brought me nothing but success and happiness. Until now. Growing angrier and angrier, I slammed open the fridge. I tasted the cream. Nothing. I tasted a tomato. Bland. A piece of cilantro. Like old, tasteless leaves in my mouth. As I grew angrier, I became more and more upset. I began pulling out everything in my fridge and trying it. Bland. 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 Gross. 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 Ugh, blah. Yuck. Disgusting. Putrid. Gross. 
vile. The apples tasted like sand. The fresh meat and vegetables began to smell rotten. The scent was making me so nauseous. Nothing was how it was supposed to be. It was all rotten and disgusting. I began throwing it all on the ground in a flurry of anger. Tomatoes crushing under my feet, butter melting, eggs dropping, raw meat and bloody chunks on the floor. I was almost done with my tantrum until I saw one last egg sitting in a corner. I don't know what possessed me to do so, but I cracked the egg right in my mouth. I threw the shells on the floor. It actually tasted normal for a second, and then I heard a peep. I gagged. My mouth tasted as if it were filled with feathers and dirt. I began puking violently again. There wasn't much in my stomach since I had spat most of it out during my fridge taste test. I crawled away from the fridge, and when I looked back, the whole pile in the dim light was gray, lacking any color whatsoever. I freaked out, turned on the lights, and, 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 and there's this huge, disgusting pile of food and vomit that was nothing but gray. Confused, I went to my pantry next. I pulled down a colorful box of cereal and dumped its contents on the table. Gray, bread, gray, pasta, gray, granola, gray, everything dumped onto the table was gray. A huge pile of nothingness. Even the rice was lacking its usual whiteness. It was then that I noticed it was less of a gray. It was a complete lack of color. I must have passed out, because I don't remember what happened next. I woke up pretty hazy. I just remember getting a phone call from work saying someone important was coming in before the restaurant opened, and they wanted me to head over ASAP and create a testing menu for some event. My head was pretty hazy, so I don't exactly remember all the details. I just put on my chef's coat and headed there as soon as I could, closing the door on my disgusting incident from the night before. When I got there, I didn't greet anyone and just headed straight to the kitchen. But I quickly realized no one was probably there anyway since it was so early. My head felt so dizzy. I, I didn't really feel like I was there. Maybe I was just hazy from not eating. <laughs> I don't even remember what I made. I just remember cooking and putting dishes on the large table in our dining area. I guess I didn't really know what I was doing. I swear I didn't. The man arrived with a woman, and the manager greeted him at the door. He must have been in his office. Maybe I was cooking for a wedding? I, I can't remember. I was finishing up the last dish, and then I heard a woman scream. I ran out, still not feeling right to go see what happened. The woman had fainted. The man was kneeling beside her, covering his mouth and holding his stomach. My, my manager was doing the same. My manager began screaming profanities at me. I can't remember. He said it smelled disgusting. Something about going into the dumpster, I think. Raw meat and bones and tentacles. Something like that. I, I can't remember. It didn't smell weird to me. He, he yelled that I was fired. I remember that part. And I just walked out feeling even more dizzy. When I looked back at the table, it did look weird. I can't exactly explain it. I began walking toward my apartment, but the road began to feel so long and wide. Then, from the corner of my eyes, darkness slowly began to take over my eyesight until everything was completely black. I'm pretty sure I passed out on the ground in the middle of the sidewalk, I woke up in the hospital with an IV drip, an oxygen mask, a beeping machine, the whole shebang. The nurse came in and smiled sweetly once she saw my eyes were a bit open. Good morning. Are you feeling well enough to sit up? I nodded and sat up a bit, removing my oxygen mask. She handed me a cup of water. I took a small sip. In that moment, my brain saw a series of images. I, I can't even remember them. I don't know why, but I threw the cup off the bed, 
letting it splash all over the floor. It was sort of a knee-jerk reaction, so I felt kind of bad when the nurse had to clean it up. I just sunk down a bit and looked away. She cleaned up the mess, jotted something down, and left. I closed my eyes again. I awoke to the nurse trying to set a tray of food down in front of me. I wondered when the last time I'd eaten was, and it felt like forever. And then I hear a noise. I narrowed it down to the tray in front of me. It was definitely making some sort of noise. Before I lifted the lid, I put my ear to it and listened. I heard screaming. Small, moaning yells of someone in agony and pain. In a frightened state, I quickly opened the lid and the moaning began to resonate across all of the walls of the room. I covered my ears and closed my eyes. It was screeching. When I opened my eyes, I didn't even see food. Not even the lack of color. Not even the pale outline of food. Something I can't even put into words. It was horrifying. I threw the plate on the floor. and My heart must have started beating real fast because I noticed the machine making even more beeping noises than usual. Nurses came rushing in. They might have sedated me with something because I quickly passed out. When I woke up next, my mother was sitting next to me holding my hand. She noticed my opened eyes. Hi, sweetie. It's mom. How are you doing? I was barely awake and nodded. They told me what's happening. Oh, I'm so sorry, sweetie. You could always talk to me about your problems. You, you know that, right? I don't know why, but I started crying. I just let the hot tears fall down my face. I couldn't exactly tell her what was happening. I mean, I couldn't even explain it myself, but... Just having someone there who you could trust and comfort you was more than overwhelming considering the horror I had gone through in the last couple of days. I just want you to know that we're going to do everything to help you get better. If only they knew what was happening. Don't worry about how much it will cost. I, I'm going to pay for it all. This, this facility is the best around. I was confused. I muttered in a low, raspy voice, I don't want to go to a facility. I'm not sick. Oh, I know, honey. They said that many girls like you are very reluctant. But you'll make friends and, and be able to talk to girls who are going through the same thing. She stroked my hand, but I pulled it away. I was sleepy, confused, and annoyed. I'm not sick. I know, sweetie, I know. You'll be able to work through your eating disorder. There are many girls who suffer from it. It's okay, sweetie. Mom will take care of it. I looked at her with my eyes furrowed. Eating disorder? <laughs> I'm not anorexic. I, I mean, look at me. <laughs> I tried to let on a little laugh. It's okay, honey. Just because you're not suffering on the outside doesn't mean you're not suffering on the inside. I didn't want to say anything, but we found your, um... We found your mess in the apartment. Someone in the building began complaining of the smell. She must have noticed I was getting upset. It's okay, it's okay. <laughs> They've educated me on bulimia and binging and, and, and purging. I looked at my mom's eyes. I didn't know how to explain myself. How could I? That's how I ended up in here. In this facility for girls with eating disorders. They stuck a feeding tube in me because I refused to eat. But it's easier to pretend this way than to tell them what's really happening. I know they'd for sure lock me up somewhere worse. <laughs> I've been taking the time to do research on what's happened to me. If anyone else has gone through the same thing. At the meetings, girls talk about their bodies, control, perfection... It's all kinds of heartbreaking stories. But I, I can't really relate. No. Not when they don't see it. The disgusting mess. The smell. They don't even hear the screaming. There were times I thought I was just crazy. Maybe it was all in my head. Maybe it was just me. 
maybe I really was ill. But the other day, I saw a girl get 5150. Before they dragged her away, I heard her yelling, It's gray! It's sand! It's gross! Get away! She screamed the whole way out. I can still hear it ringing in my ears. Now I'm worried it's spreading. If anyone thinks that food has been tasting off, please contact me and try to get help before it's too late. I'm not trying to get anybody in trouble. I mean, not my intent. So please don't go report this and get somebody fired. Those folks need those jobs. That said, <laughs> I just cannot shake my sense that my supermarket is violating health code stuff. It's the Safeway off college, you know, the, the one by the art school. I was there Sunday in the hour before they close. I, I don't usually go that late, but I'd spent time with my cousin that afternoon and, you know, just it just pushed everything back. Anyway, I park close to the door and head inside and the place does not smell right. There's a stench and it seems to be coming from everywhere. My first thought is it's got to be the carcasses. Like it just it has to be right. I don't usually start shopping in the carcass section. I don't like them just sitting in my cart and room temperature as I shop. Um, but I, I wanted to figure this odor out. I push my cart over there and the glass case is pretty picked over. There's still like a lamb carcass and a piglet carcass and like a few disemboweled hens. And like I roll, I roll by them all casually, sniffing as I go. I wager it's the birds because they were organic tortured and those tend to rot faster than animals who were tortured and pumped full of antibiotics. But the organic tortured hens don't smell any worse than anything else. I asked the butcher, were these carcasses all bled out and gutted within the last few days? And he assures me they were. And that Safeway has a seal of quality for a reason. And I believe him. I mean, because the smell isn't any worse in the carcass section than it had been at the entryway. I usually take the store aisle by aisle, but the next likely suspect is the vegetable section. I head on over there, getting ready to breathe through my mouth. But when I get there, nothing looks unusual. I bend down and smell the blood on the floor. I mean, it, it's not crusty. It's still, I mean, it's still a little bit sticky to the touch. I stand back up. And then I do the same thing I did with the carcass section. I mosey down the display, inspecting produce as I go. I pause at the tomatoes. I squeeze one. It's ripe. I pick off one of the calluses and I hold it up to the light. I mean, it's thick, all right, but that means that whoever it came from had been doing this a while, and I mean, I prefer that. I sniff the callus. Nope, no fungus. I stick the callus back to the tomato and I put it in my cart. You know, the smell is actually a little less pungent here. I move into the fruit section. And I head straight for the pineapples. I have seen flies there before. But there are no flies. These look really fresh. I mean, okay, a, a little picked over again. I mean, a Sunday night. But, I mean, good. I don't need pineapple this week, but if I did, I'd probably get at least two of these. I give one a squeeze. Tough skin. Good. Firm flesh. Plenty of fingernails. And whole ones, too. Not just the little chips you get with the apples and the kiwis. You can see the bloody nail bed roots on these. You know, they were torn away in one clean jerk. I lift a pineapple up to my ear, and sure enough, I can still hear the echo of a shriek. I mean, I'm guessing it's a woman, but it's really faint. So the pineapples don't stink. Neither do the pears. Or the melons. I give the berries, you know, an extra check because sometimes the coating of mucus and tears has a masking effect on rot. That is not the case tonight. The fruit is good. I mean, better than usual, honestly. The odor is unlikely to originate from the boxed foods, but I do a quick pass up and down the aisles. You know, they, I mean, there are ingredients I need there, but I'm fixated on this smell. So I barely look at my list. It's not coming from the breakfast aisle. It's not coming from the food taken from the pantries of murdered mothers aisle. 
not the cooking oils or the bag of crunchy ashes aisle or the peanut butter or the noodles or the condiments. Okay. Wait, okay. So the bags of crunchy ashes were two for six bucks. So I did go ahead and grab a regret and suffocation and an exploitive nacho rancho. And uh, I, I tossed them into the cart. I mean, okay. <laughs> I eat healthy, but I have my weaknesses. I'm almost ready to ask an employee where the smell is coming from when it becomes obvious to me. I mean, <laughs> it's the frozen food. Like I said, healthy eater. I don't shop in frozen foods. I don't know which foods are the likely culprits. So I follow my nose down the long line of freezers. Frankly, <laughs> I'm pretty grossed out just looking at these meals. I mean, who eats this shit? Anus meat poppers? <sighs> I mean, what? I grab that one out of the freezer and turn the box over. Yep. Come on, people. Don't look at the branding. Look at the ingredients. It's anus meat product. <laughs> I knew there was no way that thing had actual anus meat in it. I put the box back on its shelf backwards. Maybe that way someone will actually pay attention. And as I do this, I get a whiff. A strong, rancid whiff. I gag, but I'm righteously satisfied. <laughs> Bingo. I follow the whiff. I go freezer door by freezer door, opening them and inhaling, moving closer to ground zero. On the sixth door, the stench is so thick, I cough. I slam that door shut for a minute. I breathe deep. And then I open it back up. It's some frozen dinner pasta. A whole bunch of red boxes that you heat up in the microwave, right? I pull out the box closest. There's some Italian-looking guy with a big mustache and his arms flung wide. The branding reads, Mario's Landfillers Macaria. I scan the box for the sell-by date. <laughs> oh, wow. This thing isn't just expired. It's expired by almost a year. I grab the one behind it. Same story. And the one behind that. Same long-gone expiration date. I set the three expired meals on the top shelf of the cart and start looking for an employee. <laughs> I am complaining. I will be that lady tonight. I walk past three empty aisles until I see an employee standing by the hot food bar with a big cardboard box. I head over. I grab a Mac and Rhea out of my cart and I'm about to address the employee, but I halt. I cannot believe what I'm seeing. The employee is shoveling a steaming hot tray of food right into the box. <laughs> Surely he's not throwing them away. Surely. I ask, uh, excuse me. The employee jerks backward and looks at me. Uh, yeah. Those are sweet and sour mixed carcass nuggets, right? Uh, yes, ma'am. They're still hot. You're not throwing them away, right? He smirks awkwardly. Uh, it's the end of the shift, ma'am. Well, we have to. <laughs> but you can serve them again tomorrow or, or, like, donate the food to a refugee camp. He gets this scared look on his face, and I assume it's because he thinks I'm angry at him, I mean, which I am, but then a voice from behind me startles me. A man asks, Miss, is this employee bothering you? I jerk around. <laughs> it's a manager. Big name tag and everything. And his eyes are wide. Oh, oh, and he's smiling. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, <laughs> no. I spit out instantly nervous. No, I, I was just, I, I was just asking a question about the mixed carcass nuggets. Were you hoping to purchase some? Did this employee prevent you from doing what you want? No, no. I mean, I don't want any, I mean, ugh, look, are you smelling this? I shove the cold box towards the manager. These are expired. He takes it from me carefully and inspects it. His smile falls. Oh, ma'am, I am so sorry. I tell him, they're all expired, okay, by a year, and it's making the whole store smell awful. Could you please address this? 
The manager's face goes ashen. He falls to his knees and begins to weep. And I appreciate good customer service, (laughs) but I don't need waterworks. It's too late, though. The manager grabs me by the knees and starts screaming. Oh, God. Oh, God. I'm so sorry. Shame. Shame on my head. Oh, God. The fires of shame. I look over at the employee. He's resumed the shoveling the nuggets into the box, pretending not to notice. Enough. I put my hands on the sobbing manager's shoulders and try to loosen his hold. He looks me in the eyes and pleads. Punish me, ma'am. I pull my hands back. I beg you, ma'am, I can't bear the shame. Punish me. I need this to be over with. I ask him how he would like to be punished. Feed them to me, he says. But, sir, these are frozen, like, bricks. I mean, you won't be able to chew. Shove them in. This was not how I saw my Sunday going, but I initiated this moment, so I'll finish it. I open the first box. You know, it's not easy. The stench is incredible. The ingredients are fully rotten. I'll never order this dish again. (laughs) I mean, not even at a nice restaurant. Also, his mouth rips, like, a lot. There's blood, you know, a couple of other shoppers start pausing to watch, but after about 10 minutes, I managed to get the three umber blocks into his esophagus. Well, I, I mean, but you know, it it also ripped, but that's okay. I offer to help him to his feet or, you know, even breathe into his mouth a little, but the manager firmly refuses any aid. Me and the few other customers watch as he struggles to survive and, you know, when it's clear that he's died, we all clap politely. Oh, thank God. God. The employee has good customer service instincts. He breaks the mood with, ladies and gentlemen, (laughs) to thank you for your trouble, anything in the hot food bar is on the house tonight. Please enjoy. The small crowd cheers. Even me. I mean, I don't want any hot carcass tonight, but I'm clearly the only one. The other shoppers swarm the hot food bar, laughing, packing their go-to boxes with steaming chunks. The employee approaches me once more and says, Thank you for informing us, ma'am. I'll see to it that these Mac and Rias are swapped out. Thank you. And thank you for finding a creative solution rather than wasting all that hot food. You got it, ma'am. Always looking out. I nod. I go back to shopping. I check out. I go home. I make myself some dinner. A salad. And it's good. Like I said, you know, I'm not trying to get anyone else in trouble, and I appreciate the steps the Safeway staff took to fix the problem, but I still can't relax about it. (laughs) Someone there is not paying attention, and I doubt it was just one sloppy manager. Has anyone else had an experience like this at the Safeway on college? I mean, the place seems like a health department headline waiting to happen. You feel me here, right? As I write this, I can feel it burning into my scalp. I want so bad to pull the headset off. But I know exactly what'll happen. I don't think I could survive that again. When I first caught wind of the Oculus Rift, back when it was still just a Kickstarter campaign, my mind was blown. I dreamed as a kid of being able to step into my favorite video games. I daydreamed about swinging the Master Sword with my own hands. I visualized myself as a bored god making sure my sims' needs were met and making their lives miserable. The idea of being inside the world of a game sounds so impossible. Yet under two decades later, we are on the cusp of actual, tangible VR. Some people doubted it, called it fake VR, compared it to the failure of Nintendo's Virtual Boy headset. Some folks wouldn't even be happy until we got a Sword Art Online level of virtual reality, but it was... I was satisfied! Simply with sight, sound, and the ability to move my arms and interact with a world more joyful than my own. Years later, VR has come a long way. We have developers working on pixel-perfect limb movement, leg trackers, 360-degree treadmills. People are doing everything they can to make the VR experience even more real. They have no idea that it's all pointless. Once you go too far down the rabbit hole, you get stuck in hell. It all started when I attended a small VR expo in Chicago. 
with the promise of new, yet-to-be-released prototype headsets available to demo. I was guaranteed to attend. I was a VR nut now, so there was, there was no missing something like this. The expo was thrilling. There was a new headset from a lesser-known Chinese phone company that had an insanely high resolution. The demo game looked nearly real. You'd need a $3,000 gaming PC to run it. At least at speeds that won't make you nauseous. Even the desktop they hooked up to the headset was struggling to meet the 60 frames per second. Then, my personal favorite, was the headset that focused on field of view. They managed to stretch the field of view to 180 degrees, which exceeds a human's horizontal field of view and meets our vertical field of view, the more you know. When I tried this one, I could see how people could nearly forget they were even wearing a headset. It felt like putting on a different pair of eyes. And sadly, the resolution suffered, and the screen door effect was so bad, it never felt immersed. I spent several hours making multiple rounds at the event, trying a multitude of spectacular devices. As the event was coming to a close, then 20 minutes left until the building closed its doors, I spotted a modest booth that I hadn't seen previously. Strange, I thought. By then, I'd made at least a dozen laps around the entire place, yet I'd not seen this booth before. It consisted of a single black curtain with a plain black banner boasting white Times New Roman lettering that read, Conscious VR. I smirked. <laughs> These VR titles were only getting more predictable. There was a man sitting there behind a cheap folding table. In front of him was the boxiest looking headset I'd ever seen. Its goggles ended in jagged edges, the strap was loose, seemed to be made of a cheap material. It was beyond generic, reverting past basic. The man himself reflected this dismal headset, adorned with a plain white t-shirt, a tired expression in his eyes, one that had them glazed over for hours. He looked bored. I walked over. Twenty minutes was plenty of time to experience one more prototype. Conscious VR? I said, with a curious inflection. Mm-hmm. The man didn't open his mouth. So, uh, what's the gimmick? Pointing to the hefty headset. It's pretty big, so what does it, um, have like a crazy feel of view? Is it like super 8K resolution? Is it like one of those all-in-ones or something? I knelt down and got a closer look. I didn't want to handle the thing until I got some sort of reaction from the man. None of that, he muttered. Um, well then what is it? He paused for a moment, staring at me, then to the headset. Without looking back to me, he simply said, Wakes you up. I sneered. What's that supposed to mean? It's like, like a cup of coffee? He certainly believed that a VR game or device could be designed to get your blood pumping, so it wasn't too skeptical. Oh, how tired are you? He asked. Emotion still vacant in his voice. I was getting impatient. Reaching my hands out to the headset, I looked towards the man. He nodded, granting me silent, though unenthusiastic, permission. The thing was heavier than it looked. It must have been 12 pounds at least. Immediately I rolled my eyes. Whoever developed this wasted their time. Something this heavy would never be consumer or commercially friendly. I grasped the strap and stretched it over the back of my head. Then I laid the goggles on my forehead struggling to find a means to adjust the tightness of it around my head before I blinded myself with it, but couldn't find anything. No way to tighten the straps, no knobs to adjust the forward position of the goggles, nothing. I need to hold it, I heard the man said, seemingly seconds away from a deep yawn. Seriously? A headset you have to hold? If there goes any hope of innovation or even enjoyable gameplay you could have out of it. With a sigh, I did as he instructed. I held it at a position as comfortable as the awkward device would allow. The screen was black. Is it on? I asked. There was no reply. This guy was starting to piss me off. Is there a button I need to press? Still silence. Forget it. I wasn't going to stand there and be made a fool of by someone who shouldn't have been there to sell me on the idea. I yanked off the headset. I immediately fell backward onto the ground, breathless. Everything was black. Every direction, up, down, left, right, it was all blackness, perfectly dark. It didn't sway or falter. A blackness flawless was unnatural, unnerving. 
I began to panic. I could feel my my breathing speeding up and becoming more shallow. It was a it was a struggle to pick myself back up and remain on two legs as I couldn't see anything to balance myself with, no frame of reference. And when I was standing again, I attempted to look at my hands. There was nothing. I screamed. But the blackness seemed to swallow the sound. If there ever was a sound, I couldn't be sure. Was I blind? Was I deaf? Was I dead? I kept reaching up to pull off the headset, which I, I could have sworn I already did, but I, I felt nothing but my hair and skin. At least, at least I was still there. Then, the electricity came. A deep, sharp, stinging pain that ran through me from top to bottom like a bolt of lightning. It was, it was pain so intense that all other thought left my mind, and though I could not see it, I felt the dribble of saliva flowing out of my mouth like some tased criminal suspect. When I woke up, my entire body was asleep. A thousand needles per square inch of my flesh. My vision had returned. The headset was gone. And I lay there on the floor of the event building alone. I sat up awkwardly. The needles slowly fading. My head was a mess of agony and confusion. The building was empty. Had everyone left me there? Packing up and leaving? How did they do that? Had I passed out and no one cared? I picked myself up and I carried myself to the glass front doors. For some reason, they weren't locked. I was able to leave without a problem. Ruggly, I made my way back to my hotel. I had a plane to catch in the morning and I had no way of knowing what time it was because the numbers on my phone were too blurry to read. How I made it back to my hotel bed alive or at all was a surprise. I lay there, eyes closed, enjoying the comfort of thread counts higher than I had had at home. I felt fine then, save for the remnant of a headache. I looked towards the digital clock on the nightstand. 2.17 a.m. The journey back to the hotel certainly didn't take more than half an hour, so I must have been unconscious for a while. Even so, I was extremely tired. I found it difficult to keep my eyelids open, and raising my arms was a, was a skirmish against my own body. So with some effort, I adjusted my pillow, and I shut my eyes. But sleep did not come. Something was keeping me up. At first I thought it was the headache, but it soon became clear to me that the headache wasn't actually a headache. There was an ache above my ears, wrapping around the entirety of my scalp like a circle. I could feel something there, something that hurt the longer it remained on me. For a moment I assumed the heavy headset had left a sore spot around my entire head. Naturally I reached up to feel the source of my discomfort. My eyes flew open and taut. They began to water, quickly, quickly swelling to a point where tears flowed down my face. What my fingers came into contact with was not a sore on my flesh, but a, a cloth webbing. It was the same kind of material that the headset had been made out of. I shot up and began to scour my own face with my hands, feeling immediately a bulky apparatus in front of my eyes, in front of my own vision, and somehow I didn't see it. I choked on my saliva. I yanked at the strap and clasped the thing in front of my eyes, raising it above my head. In a sudden transition, the world around me changed. The hotel room disappeared as the apparatus came off. Around me instead was my own bedroom. My wife sleeping soundly at my side, though I remember her having blonde hair, not auburn. A morning sun burned my retinas through the glass pane, but I remembered that window being on the opposite side of the room. Shivering, I looked down at my hands. Lying within their grasp sat a jet black device. It wasn't the same device as the conscious VR headset that I had expected. This is more sleek. Quite a bit lighter, more professional design. My eyes strained to open wider, ready to come apart of the seams. Mm. Honey, did you really wear that to bed? I turned sharply. My wife stretched herself awake and it greeted me with a reference to this device that I thought I'd never seen before. What? No, I... Speaking was difficult. My throat was dry and trembling even more than my exterior. You always wake up acting so weird when you go to bed with that. I told you to stop. It can't be good for your mind. She climbed out of bed with a yawn and made her way to the bathroom. 
Yet I recall the bathroom entrance being in the hallway. I took the opportunity to re-examine the headset. It looked typical. A strap, some adjustment knobs, some sort of softer-than-foam material applied to the inside of the goggles. If anything, it just seemed like a consumer-perfected version of a VR headset. But then I turned it about to see the lenses. There weren't any lenses. Rather, there in the middle of the top of the goggles sat a metal connector, a dongle of some kind, similar to the shape of a, of a USB Type C. My mouth was agape. I reached out and touched the connector. There was some sort of brownish red residue on the side. Is that blood? Instinctively, my hand flew up to my own forehead where the goggles would have met my face. A chill ran down my spine. My fingers met a small hole that perfectly matched the shape of the dongle. I must have sat there thoughtless and silent for a while, because the next thing I knew, my wife stood nervously at the bathroom door in a robe. Henry? Henry, is it happening again? Eyes watering, my gaze slowly met hers. I failed to blink, and I swear, for the briefest of moment, I forgot how to breathe. In a sort of shell shock, I watched my wife pick up her phone and dial an ambulance. I was taken to the hospital. An exasperated doctor looked over my eyes and forehead through a minuscule flashlight. Henry... You were in here last week. I told you to take a break from that headset. My mouth didn't budge. I had nothing to say. Eh, yeah. Uh... Yes. Okay. You see, your excessive use is causing a blood leak. While not usually fatal, it can cause disorientation and even seizures. I stared down at my hands. For some reason, all I could do was listen and count my fingers. One, two, three, four... I want you to stay here tonight, while we monitor your brain activity. Five, six, seven. Are you listening, Henry? We will keep an eye on you, but when you leave in the next couple of days, promise me to take a break from that thing. And, by God, don't go to bed with it. Eight, nine, ten. The doctor spoke to my wife just outside the room. A nurse came in to apply some monitors to my heart and temples. She let me know that if I, if I felt a seizure coming on, or if I didn't feel right, I simply needed to press this red button next to the bed. My wife came in, kissed me, cried a bit, told me to get better, and she left. That night, the hospital was quiet, but I lay awake trying to figure this out. Was this reality? Had I come back to the real world from some sort of hyper-realistic escapism? If this was the real world, why didn't I remember it? Sure, for the most part, my wife was the same. Our house was the same. The decorations were the same. It's... The only big difference was the headset. I never remembered a headset like this existing. I didn't recall having surgery to implant in a, an insertion point into my skull. This, this world was like the one I remembered, but only slightly different. My mind raced. I was beginning to wear myself down. Maybe I was overreacting to this. After all, if everything was essentially the same besides the technology of some weird headset, maybe... Maybe I was worrying about nothing. I'd just go home, live my life as usual, and stop worrying about my wife by using this damn headset so much. <laughs> I winced. My temples throbbed. Were they sending some sort of current to these monitors? I reached up to feel them and... My heart stopped. Webbing. A strap. Another headset. Tremors flooded me as I lowered my hands. This time, I was too terrified to immediately rip off the apparatus. I was not prepared for another transition, another revelation showing me that not even this was real. I was still in yet another virtual world. I swallowed hard, but nothing went down. My throat was drier than ever. I didn't want to do it, but I knew I had to. If I didn't reach up and pull off this headset, I'd only live on not knowing. Living a lie. Steadily, one inch at a time, my hands moved in unison up to the straps that I was now fully aware of. These were thinner, yet somehow sturdier than the last. Came off easily. I kept my eyes shut tight and only opened them slowly once the headset was entirely off. It took a moment for my eyes to adjust to the brightness of the room I was in. Once I came to, I could make out a large auditorium full of hundreds of people, laughter, excitement, just plain positivity. 
If I had to guess, this was an expo, but much larger than the one I attended with the Conscious VR booth. I quickly located a large banner toward the back of the hall. Welcome. Step into another world, 2019. What'd you think? An ecstatic voice nearly shouted in front of me. Huh? I managed to say. I looked ahead of me. I was holding the headset, which consisted of a thin white strap, a small rectangular box, a far cry from the goggle shape I was used to. The cubic is great, huh? It's the smallest extenuous world device on the market. The guy was short but built. He obviously took care of himself. He was very excited about this product. Well, it's not on the market yet, but obviously we're going to make some waves, right? Strenuous world. Is that what they call VR here? Once again, my breathing became troublesome and stressed. The world already seemed far more different compared to the last shift. People wore hairstyles that seemed out of place to me. Several other people walked around with IVs coming from stylized backups and implemented into their wrists like the world's version of vaping. A woman walked in with a species of animal I didn't recognize. Without a word, I handed the device back to him and walked away. I exited the event, searched for my wallet, and thankfully found a key card with the information in my hotel room. When I made it back to my room, I sat down at a rolling chair in front of a thin wood desk where a laptop lay. I opened it. I quickly scanned over the icons, Google Chrome, Microsoft Edge, a classic RuneScape launcher. It was exactly the same as my original laptop. The brands were the same, the icon positions were the same, even the classic RuneScape played identically to what I remembered. My head collapsed out of my hands and I sobbed. I wanted to scream, yet I, I sat convulsing in tears because, I, because it didn't matter that the differences still weren't major, because it didn't matter that I, I could probably pick up the phone and still hear from my very same loving wife. I cried because I had absolutely no idea what original actually meant anymore. I cried because as my face sat in the palm of my hands in a puddle of my own tears, I could feel yet another set of webbing around my head, another strap, another headset, another fake world. I haven't shifted worlds again. I'm still in the last one, noticing more and more differences than I had before. That new Nintendo console I purchased a couple months ago, it hasn't released yet here. The Pomeranian puppy I bought as a kid for my birthday? It's a German Shepherd now, but worst of all, I noticed the first major difference within one of these shifts when I flew back home. My daughter. A five-year-old little girl who begged for a puppy and a bunk bed so that her friend would have a place to sleep during sleepovers. She wasn't our daughter anymore. She was now a 14-year-old he. I still feel the same love and, ador and adoration as I should, but the... The effects this had on my psyche only grew, even as I continue to ignore the ache of the strap around my head. It burns, it throbs, it stings. Every second of every day, I can feel the pain of it. I can feel it indenting itself into my flesh on the other side. Every sore sensation screams at me to pull the headset off, but I'm... I'm too afraid. I know things will, will get different. My definition of real will only drift further away. I don't think I can handle it again. Even though I know beyond this headset, there'll be another. And another. And yet another. And I'm afraid that with each removal of the headset, I place myself closer to a more hellish reality. A reality closer to truth. A reality where my daughter... I mean, where my son doesn't exist. Reality where I'm alone, bedridden, diseased, paralyzed. Worse. Maybe a fake world isn't the worst one to live in. I just wish it didn't hurt so much. His death came as a huge surprise to me. My father, the charmer he is, always says, the only surprise is how long he lasted. My brother had issues with depression and addiction, and he'd been in and out of rehab since high school, but he'd never attempted something like this before. What he had done is fall off the wagon over and over again. Maybe, maybe I'm an idiot for putting this kind of hope into an addict, but this time felt different. 
He'd been sober for a few months, his longest run ever. Gotten a job. He was doing really well from what I could tell. He even started to talk about becoming a writer. I'd never known him to have a dream, so this was really big for me. What I'm trying to say is he didn't... He didn't seem like someone who was planning to kill himself. He seemed like he was... He was really determined to stay sober this time. I got my hands on his journal a few days ago. I knew he'd been keeping one since he got out of rehab, and I was really hoping there'd be some kind of clue as to what happened. Honestly, I have no idea what to make of its contents. If taken at face value, it looks like he might have had some kind of psychotic break or something like that. But like I said, he seemed to be in a relatively good place. If he was going to snap, I feel like it would have happened when things were really bad for him, which they were for years. They spoke to him a few times before it happened, and he seemed pretty lucid, like, like he didn't say anything that raised any red flags or hinted that he might be hallucinating. Even his writing reads like it always did if you ignore the subject matter. You know, I've, been, I've been up for days, poring over his journal, trying to make heads or tails of what he was going through. I hit a wall, honestly. It's just... It's just that it isn't adding up. I'm hoping that stepping away from it for a couple of days will give me a fresh perspective. I'm going to post his journal entries here in the meantime. I'm not quite sure what I'm hoping for, but it feels... It feels wrong to sit around and do nothing. I think it's important to mention that there was literally hundreds of entries in this journal. I'm, I'm, I'm only posting the ones I think are relevant to his breakdown. Entry 1. April 12th. 2019. I posted my first story on Reddit today. Didn't get much attention, so I ended up taking it down. One of the few people who did see it DM'd me. He, I, I assume, said he liked the way I wrote, and that he needed some authors to beta test a program that he and his team had been working on. He asked if I was interested. I mean, I, I wasn't. But I was. I'm not a accepting offers from internet strangers kind of guy, but people aren't exactly scrambling to hire me right now. Most most employers aren't interested in a guy that got caught stealing painkillers from the pharmacy he worked at. Shocker, I know. Well, I waited a few minutes to see if someone with a job offer was going to knock down my door at the last second. And when that didn't happen, I accepted the Reddit guy's offer. We exchanged emails, he sent me a bunch of crap to sign, including a non-disclosure agreement. Not sure who he thought I'd be telling. And beta testing software isn't exactly something that you shout from the rooftops. Well, I'm expecting to spend at least eight hours a day during the week working on the program. God, I can already feel my back cramping. Whatever, it pays well enough. It's not like I'm doing anything better. So. Let's start tomorrow. Time I thought about drinking today, 25. Times I thought about pills today, 18. Cigarettes smoked, 6. Entry 2, April 11th, 2019. Holy hell. Okay, that took me two hours. Two hours to get through the instruction section of the program. I read all sorts of stuff about character types and what I can and cannot do with the program. There's a lot of mention of something called the Storyscape, but I'm still not entirely sure on what that is. I didn't ask what kind of program it was, but I figured I didn't need to. There aren't many programs one would need writers to test. To the best of my knowledge, it's a collaborative life simulator, according to instructions. Which, by the way, took me two hours to read. I know I said it already, but I'm still pissed about it. These tech nerds really blow my mind. They can create a whole collaborative whatever, but a simple summary is completely outside the realm of possibility. I'll be responsible for watching over a character, following their day-to-day -day life, and um, intervening in subtle ways to make stuff happen. What exactly that stuff is will be defined by assignments given to me by the program. See? That wasn't so hard, was it? Anyway, I guess that makes some kind of video game. Cool. I like video games. I've managed to break the instructions down into a few important bullets. I'm going to write them down here so I don't have to slog through the crap again if I forget something. An author must complete every assignment they're given. Failure to do so will result in termination of their contract. There are two types of characters, complex and throwaway. Once a character is created, it cannot be deleted. It exists within the storyscape and will perform actions until its death. An author can create throwaway characters to perform a specific task. Complex characters cannot be created by an author. Only an admin can create complex characters. Complex characters have free will. Their decisions and subsequent actions are their own. Hmm. Free will. 
That happened. I didn't make that up. That was actually in the instructions. Long-winded and melodramatic. Finally clicked out of the instructions and was greeted with an overhead view of this boy's bedroom. I really didn't expect the graphics to be so good. It wasn't... I wasn't expecting graphics, honestly. It reminded me a bit of that game, The, the Sims. Uh, but it was way less cartoony. Uh, put together this digital world. It was a storyscape that they were talking about. I moused over the kid and a little box popped up over his head. Jared Redford, 8, Complex. I did the tutorial, which basically just walked me through Jared's first day of grade school. It played through kind of like a movie. The important scenes getting screen time and everything else being skipped over. How the program decides what is and isn't important is beyond me. It all seems pretty mundane so far. Supposedly there's an option to play through the entire day, but... Honestly, who has time for that? The first assignment I got was make new friends, and the tutorial showed me all my options for accomplishing that. Can't control Jared directly, but I can do a whole bunch of other things like, like, make thoughts pop into his head, um, control the intensity of specific emotions, give him gut feelings, cause little muscle spasms, a bunch of other things. Seems like the whole point of giving the character free will was to have me bend it. Why not just let me control the character and be done with it? Yeah. A whole day took me around 10 minutes to complete. I made a throwaway fifth grader, had him knock Jared's books out of his hands in the hallway. He ended up making friends with the two kids that helped him pick everything up. Man, wish someone came to my rescue like that when I was a kid. Maybe then I wouldn't have ended up as a recovering addict babysitting a digital eight-year-old. Oh, um, times I thought about drinking today, 22. Times I thought about pills today, 29. Um, cigarettes smoked, nine. Entry 3, May 4th, 2019. The attention the developers pay to detail is impressive. It's been around three weeks real-time since I started using the program, which translates to a little less than three years within the storyscape. Mikey and Jackson, the two kids who came to Jared's rescue on the first day of third grade, have become his best friends in the entire world. The three of them are completely inseparable, which is why Jared was devastated when Jackson's parents started talking about moving to another town. They crushed him understandably. Yes, in theory, they could still see each other, but they'd be at the mercy of their parents who probably wouldn't want to make the 30 or something minute drive all that often. Watching Jared try to pretend like everything was okay, even though even though he wanted to cry all the time, really hit home for me. He, he wasn't a freak or anything like that, but he he did have a difficult time connecting with people. He He's in his head a lot. It makes him appear awkward on the surface. Jackson, was one of the few people who took the time to get to know Jared, to see him lose that. He deserves better, that's all I'm saying. I waited to see if the assignment would come in for me to stop Jackson's parents from moving. When it didn't, I decided to go ahead and stop them anyway. I made a throwaway, stuck her in a house that looked very much like the one that Jackson's parents would want to buy. I made it her purpose in life to sell that house for significantly below market value, and had her post up flyers around the area where Jackson's mom likes to power walk. I also made a second throwaway character and had him drunk drive his car through the living room of the other house. It can never be too thorough. Long story short, it worked, and Jackson's family ended up moving right down the street from Jared. When Jared found out and that cloud that had been hanging over his head disappeared, it felt like my insides unclenched at once. I hadn't even realized how tense I was. That's not the impressive part, though. When everything was said and done, I started to think about the throwaway character I created. I literally added a lot to Jared's neighborhood, and built a digital house on it instantaneously, yet no one within the story's gate batted a digital eye. I watched the throwaway I made, walk her dog and stuff, and it seemed like people knew who she was, despite the fact that she didn't exist until a minute ago. They waved to her, said good morning, all that normal neighborly stuff. The program has this timeline feature. But you can go back and look at any event that happened from the day you booted up the program for the first time. It showed that the house was always there. The woman had always lived in it. I'm not exactly an expert on this kind of stuff, but it seems like the program retroactively generated a whole life to the throwaway. It sort of makes sense when you think about it. When I'm in public, I often think about the fact that every single person I pass on the street is living their own lives. There might be throwaways in my story, but in theirs... They're the main character. They have their own history, their own social security number, family, home, etc. If you were suddenly to take an interest in their lives and dig deep enough, you'll find all those things. It's like a trail of breadcrumbs that shows 
shows this person existed long before they flashed across your field of vision. If someone in the storyscape decided to play detective and couldn't find those breadcrumbs, that might raise more than a few red flags. I know that sounds crazy, but you wouldn't even believe how advanced this AI is. I sometimes forget that people I'm watching aren't real. The rules did say that complex characters have free will. Maybe. Maybe that means they're capable of, of, a, of a higher level of thinking as well. Maybe, maybe it would be possible for them to figure out they're part of a simulation. Maybe it's already happened before. That's why the developers put in that feature. I wonder what happened to the characters that put all the pieces together. Times I thought about drinking today, 35. Times I thought about pills today, 19. A cigarette smoked, 8. Entry 4, May 17th, 2019. Middle school was more or less what you would expect. Puberty, self-discovery, peer pressure, the whole gauntlet, really. Um, everything except an interest in girls. I guess his hormones hadn't really reached critical mass yet. Maybe he's a late bloomer. The majority of the assignments were more long-term means meant to carry out in high school. Things like prepare for high school football and uh, cultivate an interest in the forensics club. Maybe, you um, both have been easy enough so far. For football, I've been increasing his feelings of happiness and determination every time he does something physical or, or watches football on TV. For forensics, I had a throwaway cause a programming error that made an episode of CSI pop up on a channel that Jared was watching after school. He started watching it on the internet now. They've also started giving me quick assignments to do at the same time. I, I have a theory that the program is trying to maintain some kind of equilibrium. Like... For every handful of positive effects, there's a, a few negative ones to balance them out. Guess it wouldn't be all that realistic if Jared was happy all the time. Honestly, I really don't like doing negative things to him. When I, when I see him all sad and dejected over something he can't control, it makes me feel like someone punched me in the gut. You know, it's, it's like I'm looking at myself, 14 years old, wondering what I did to deserve the hurt that I was feeling I wonder if he can also feel that feeling of powerlessness. It falls thick and dark around him like, like blackberry syrup. I wonder how often he feels like he's drowning in his own bedroom. I hope never. I don't want him to feel like I did. I don't want him to feel... I don't want him to hate his life so much that he turns to drugs and alcohol to cope with it. He, um... Shouldn't have to mire through his life. I did enough of that for both of us. Times I thought about drinking today, 32. Times I thought about pills today, 41. Cigarettes smoked, 11. Entry 5, May 23rd, 2019. In a strange but very welcomed turn of events, Jared has a girlfriend. Not gonna lie, I was starting to think that he might be gay. Not that there was anything wrong with that, but he he does live in a conservative town. Uh, I, I didn't want to have to to deal with coming out in a place like that. It turns out that he he hadn't met the right girl yet, and by that I mean he hadn't met any girl that even remotely interested him. Then Melody got transferred into his chemistry class. His jaw hit the floor so hard I had to remind him to close it before he drooled all over himself. It was like someone reached into his brain, took his idea of a perfect woman, and then then stuck her in his class, which might have been what actually happened, but we won't go there right now. Funny, I never would have thought redheads were his type. Guess that explains his disinterest in the rest of the local ladies. Melody was the first redheaded girl that I'd seen in the entire storyscape. I spent the whole class filling his head with confidence-boosting thoughts. I decided to exercise one of my most intrusive powers and hijack the little voice in his head. Take a deep breath. You got this. She's just a girl, nothing to be scared of. Look, she's smiling at you. Smile back. It felt weird being inside his head like that, especially when I imagined someone doing the same thing to me. But it really helped. After class, he was so pumped, he walked straight up to her and asked if she wanted to go see a movie. A few dates later, my man gets up the courage to ask her to be his girlfriend. No little voice required. And she says, yes. He was so happy, it actually brought a tear to my eye. First happy tear I've cried. Uh, well, ever, really. Times I thought about drinking today, 15. 
times I thought about pills today. Seventeen. Cigarettes smoked. Seven. Entry sixth. June 10th, 2019. You know, I hate myself. I hate myself. I hate whoever wrote these, these stupid assignments. I, I only got one assignment today. Probably would have gotten more if I stayed on, but I'm done for now. Maybe forever. I don't know. When the assignment to break his heart came in, I just stared at it for a while, long enough to see that the program wasn't going to allow the day to progress until I started to take necessary steps to do so. By the fifth or sixth loop, the program started reminding me that if I didn't complete the assignment, I would be fired. I just don't understand why he needed a heartbreak. I mean, yeah, okay, it's a learning experience and all that, but there's there's other ways to learn. Let the kid have his young love. Let it let it end naturally and, and be a fond memory for him. Not something that pops into his head during bouts of insomnia. I don't I don't use the word love lightly, by the way. Jared Jared loved that girl. And it really showed in his actions. I'm no expert on love, but I know a good relationship when I see one. She was a good influence on him. Maybe not directly. I mean she she drank a little more than than I would have liked, but but her presence made made Jared want to do his best. Every test he aced, he aced for her. Every touchdown he scored, he scored for her. She became everything to him. Yeah, I, I acknowledge that. That probably wasn't healthy, but who cares? He was happy. Of course, I have to be the one to put a stop to that. I did my best to remind myself that this was just a simulation. Jared wasn't real. Rather, was Melody. But that wasn't working anymore. Doesn't matter if he's real or not. My connection to him is real. Thank God, I'm such an asshole. I did it for the money. That's that's all there is to it. I, I broke my little buddy's heart for a stupid paycheck. And not even a good one. Jesus. I did my best to make it so that Jared could heal. He had to hate her. That was going to happen. If she still had feelings for him or had any reason to keep asking himself, what if I had done things differently? And this could become a weight that he carries for the rest of his life. High school romance or not, that that stuff sticks with you. It was this party that they were supposed to go to. Just a typical no parents, no rules type of shindig on Friday night. Jared ended up deciding not to go. A week before he'd showed up to a Saturday practice, hung over, and Coach flew off the handle. He didn't want to risk it. He told Melody she should go. Trusted her completely. So in his mind, there was nothing to worry about. Made a throwaway. Boy from another school, chiseled, handsome, tall. Standard high school dreamboat. His purpose was to seduce her. I really hoped it wasn't going to work. How she felt the same way about Jared he felt about her. She would have enough respect for their relationship, not throw it all away, for one drunk hookup. She'd prove herself worthy of that trust. And the eggheads that made this program would look at the outcome and say, Wow, I didn't expect that. Well, love is love. Can't mess with that. Wouldn't that be nice? Unfortunately, reality is very rarely nice. Apparently the same goes for virtual reality. I had the throwaway take a video and send it around. It was an awful way for Jared to find out. But I had to make sure that he really, really hated her. So much so that it would eclipse how much he loved her. Worked. Maybe too well. He, uh, he's been having reoccurring dreams, which... And I look inside them, I can see blurry images, really violent ones, where he does unspeakable things to a girl with fiery hair. He wakes up sweaty and crying, and usually... Usually... He can't fall back to sleep afterward. His grades are slipping. Coach moved him off the starting lineup. He dropped out of the forensics club. His life... His life's falling apart. Right before my eyes, and it, it's all... It's all my fault. I don't think I can do this again. Times I thought about drinking, 42. Times I thought about pills today, 37. Cigarettes smoked, 16. Entry 7, June 11th, 2019. That stupid piece... Okay, I called that asshole that gave me this job, and... 
told him I was done. You know what he said to me? You can't quit. I told him there was literally nothing he could do to stop me. I didn't even want my last paycheck. I just wanted to delete the stupid program and forget any of this ever happened. I told him if the, if the complex characters have free will, then, then I, I do too. And what I want is to put this whole stupid thing behind me. He tells me that if I quit now, they'll have to find someone else to write Jared. Hasn't he been through enough? I shouted on the phone. He hasn't fulfilled his purpose, he said to me so casually, like he was telling me he needed to stop by the store and pick up milk. I wished that I could reach to the phone and break his nose. Every character in the storyscape is a single part of a greater whole. They need to fulfill their purpose for the good of the story. I practically begged him to just leave Jared alone. AI or not, he can feel things. I know it. That prick that just, just kept saying that his hands were tied. We serve the story, he kept saying. God, I'm so, I'm so frustrated. I mean, what, what kind of, what kind of sick guy or a group of sick guys does stuff like this? They created Jared, bestowed him with sentience, gave him feelings and free will. For what? Just so he could really feel the pain they intended to inflict on him? To make him smart enough to, to wish that he had never been born when his heart shattered into a million tiny pieces? What's his purpose? To be an addict? Because he's sure as hell headed down that way with the amount that he's been drinking. I don't know, it might feel like I'm being overdramatic about the whole high school breakup thing, because listen to this. I overheard a conversation between Jared and his dad the other day. The program skips their interactions so often, I didn't even realize his mother wasn't in the picture. I did some digging. I found out his mom was, was ridiculously abusive. She used to lock Jared in a closet and make him kneel in frozen peas when he misbehaved. She said it was because he was an awful child born with poison inside him. He needed to learn to be well-behaved and not spread his poison to other people or everyone he loved would die, her included. What a messed up thing to say to a child. She was diagnosed with multiple mental illnesses and committed to a mental institution. I looked her up. She looked so pathetic, drugged to high hell, glassy-eyed, slack-jawed, fire-red hair so wild and unkempt, I would have believed it if you told me she was raised by wolves. I wanted to hate her for what she did to Jared, and then... Then I moused over her, and I found out she's a complex character, too. And that means somebody probably wrote her into a psychotic break. It's not her fault. No, it's their fault. They're, they're monsters. They're going to keep bending Jared till he breaks. I can't quit. Next author won't give a, a rat's ass about him. I have to follow the assignment. But what I do in between them is up to me. I can spend my time making him happy, undo the hurt the assignments do, whatever purpose he's... I mean, screw whatever purpose he's meant to fulfill. I won't let them use him for their stupid story. Times I thought about drinking today, I don't count. Times I thought about pills today, no idea. Cigarettes I smoked a lot. Entry 8, June 13th, 2019. I can't believe my eyes right now. I thought at first there was something wrong with the program, like like some kind of graphical glitch or something like that, but I, I shut it down, I turned it back on. Nope, there it was. There it was. Assignment. Kill Melody. It probably shouldn't be as surprised as I am. I should have expected something like this from the pieces of... The guys that made this program. They want to make Jared into a killer. That must be the purpose that they were telling me about on the phone. Well, I'm not doing it. We're not doing it. Not going to happen. They have absolutely no right to pull something like this. No. I'm going to find out where these wastes of human life work. And I'm going to end the whole office. Who are the hell are they to play God? I need a drink. Entry 9. 
June 14th or 15th, 2019. His handwriting is getting pretty sloppy here, so it's hard to tell. I had to do it. I had to. I, I didn't want to. I didn't want to, but I had to. I had to try to save him from it. I made a, a drunk driver hit him. I made, a, I made a gunman try to shoot him. Put a pilot to crash a plane into his house. Quick, easy deaths. It's better for him. I called the asshole. Said, the storyscape needs a serial killer. Serial killer. Serial killer. So Melody would be the first of many. No, 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 no. I won't do that. You have to. Or we'll find someone who will. Oh, yeah, well, I'll never let it happen. I'll sit here and I'll undo everything you try to do to him. Everything. I don't care if it takes the rest of my life. Fine. We'll find another killer. Jared will be his first victim. We'll make sure the next one likes to take things slow. Click. When I looked at the assignment again, it said hunt or be hunted. I couldn't let him be hunted. I tried to kill him all night. They just undid everything. Brought us right back to the beginning of the day. Jared didn't even know what was happening to him. It's better for him to be the hunter. He'd be happier that way. Pulled images from his dreams. Images of a girl with fire red hair, bound, gagged, trying her best to scream, but only managing to muffle. Eyes wide, bloodshot. Cheeks streaked with tears, dried fresh. Pushed his happiness and satisfaction as high as it would go. I helped him make the plan. Mostly nudging him gently in the right direction, but hijacking the little voice in his head. I didn't want him to get caught. At the rot in the jail cell, he deserved freedom. I let him pick the murder weapon, suggested a gun. Make it quick, easy. He didn't want it, though. He picked an axe. The forensics club had taught him that genetic material would be his undoing. He wore a hairnet, under a beanie, under a ski mask. Leather gloves, surgical mask. He wore dark clothes that covered as much skin as possible. He picked out a place to bring her. Old electrical shed in the woods behind his neighborhood. Hadn't been used in years. Lock was rusty, easy to break. He followed her for days. Waited for an opening. Football had made him fast enough to rush her before she knew what was going on, strong enough to knock her out in one punch, carry her unconscious body to his car. Tied her up, placed a gag in her mouth, just like in his dreams. Gave her speech before he killed her. I wasn't really listening. Something about how much she hurt him. The little bit I did catch sounded ambiguous. He avoided specifics focused on the pain I could tell he'd gone over his speech a thousand times in his head, maybe tens of thousands. Kept touching her hair. Kept running his fingers through it, looking at it with tear-blurred eyes. Pressing handfuls of it to his nose. I think it... I think I counted 57 swings of the axe. She looked like mincemeat when he was done. Mushy pile of gore with fire-red, blood-matted hair plastic tarp that he put down beforehand made it clean up really easy. A little check mark appeared next to the assignment. Jared slept more soundly that night than he had since the breakup. He bought a bottle of Jack Daniels. Entry 10. July 17th, 2019. There's more to this than I'm saying. I know it. Jared's real. He's real whether he's Physically real or not, he isn't just lines of code wrapped in a convincing character model. What if the story escapes just another dimension? That'd make me a deity of some sort who, who, who used his power to create a monster. He keeps killing. I haven't touched my keyboard, I just leave the program running while I drink and Jared does what he does. Free will, my ass, I made him this. I manipulated him into making decisions he thought. He thought were his own. He only believed he had free will. Maybe it's the same for me. I did everything I was told, reluctantly or otherwise. Kept following those assignments until they, whoever the hell they are, got whatever they wanted. They served the story and I served them. The thought that keeps popping up in my head. How do I know my feelings are mine? You know, my, my love for Jared. They need to protect him, see him happy. What if that was put inside my head? What if someone 
was sitting at their computer jacking up my happiness, my empathy, my compassion. And I think about it, Jared and I didn't even have that much in common, but somehow I felt like we were kindred spirits. What if I haven't been the only one inside my head this whole time? What if, what if I've never been the only one inside my head? I would explain it, my pain, my life, my addictions. All those are just parts of my story, little pieces of an ins inciting incident that would drive me to my, my purpose. What purpose? How many, how many layers are there to this thing? How many endless authors out there Fingers dancing along their keyboards, keystrokes reaching into the storyscape to gently bend the, the free will of the complex characters. To, to do what? Write their storyscapes? Manipulate their characters? No. Where does it begin? God, my head. Swimming. I won't be a part of this. I won't be someone's puppet. If my theory's right and I'm a, a complex character, then that means I have free will. I, I have the illusion of it, at least. As long as I live my actions, I'll, I'll never be my own, even if they feel that way. There, there'll always be an invisible hand guiding me. There will always be an author behind a keyboard. I won't let it happen. I will be free. I will be free. I will have free will. And I will be free. Five weeks after the diagnosis, my grandmother was dead. She was a proud, stubborn woman from the Appalachian Hills. Too proud, too stubborn to see a doctor until she'd lost 40 pounds and the cancer had had her fully in its thrall. The cancer's victory is what brought me to my first wake. I've been lucky growing up. While both my grandfathers died before I was born, my parents were healthy, as were my grandmothers, until, well, the one suddenly wasn't. I didn't know death until I was an adult and Grandma Jo had passed. This being my first go-around, I didn't know what to do for the wake. Dress black, look sad. Seemed like a good start. I drove my Jeep to a lovely pearl white funeral home that I'd passed so many times as a kid without realizing one day. One day I'd be its guest. I'd gotten into a fender bender at an intersection in front of the Rocky funeral home property when I was a teen. It seemed like a lifetime ago. Walked into the inviting space for the first time, felt the immediate oppressive quiet that only ever accompanies a room with a corpse in it. I signed the guest book. I walked into the main area of the home. Dozens of white upholstered wooden chairs sat in a row like some sort of perverse movie theater. The feature at the front was a handsome brown coffin, smothered in teal and pink flowers. With my mom and dad, I stayed at the back of the room for as long as I could until my feet told me that it was time to begin the ritual. You don't walk towards a coffin so much as it it grows to meet you. I didn't want to look at the body, but my eyes did. The, um, cadaver's stillness matched the quiet of the room. The first time you see a dead human being, you can't quite comprehend how little it resembles a living one. A white dress was draped over Grandma's tiny form, one that I had never seen her wear in life. Her fingers were draped over her chest, long, rigid, flaxen. I maneuvered down the macabre line a bit to be closer to her face. It was impossibly pale and featureless. Her eyes were closed, her makeup a powdery mask, looking down at the white visage. I could scarcely comprehend how it ever moved. How the muscles and bone behind the skin ever exerted themselves enough to speak, smile, taste, eat, or scream. I stared at the face. Imagining if I could ever again see something so inert or so lifeless. When the mouth twitched. Not realizing what I was doing, I fell back and I jerked into my mom's arm. I was now behind her, positioning her body closer to the thing that shouldn't have moved. But somehow it does. My mom looked back at me and perhaps 
and expected to find despair on my face, instead finding fear. It's okay, honey, she said. We can go sit down. No, I said. I, I, I'll say goodbye. Lord knows why I wanted to, but I did. I couldn't just not say goodbye to my grandmother because I had, I had hallucinated something impossible. I gingerly stepped back out in front of my mom and came face to dead face once again. Her hands and her head were still as they had ever been. I stared deeply into the closed lids, softly whispering my goodbye. The mouth twitched again. I didn't look away this time. I couldn't. Instead, I placed both my hands on the side of the coffin and I peered in closer. The mouth was no longer twitching. I could see a, a shape brushing against the inside of the lips like a, like a snake, desperate to escape. The mouth began to open ever so slightly, and a hissing sound escaped it. The lips parted again and again as though trying to speak, but they were, they were restrained by the wires that held the jaw shut behind them. Finally, the lips, whatever muscle remained, beat the wires like the cancer they couldn't. The mouth opened just barely and, and enough times in a row to speak in a low, pained rumble. We're supposed to be in this together. <gasps> I woke up outside, still dressed in black. It, it was a cold autumn afternoon, but I felt tremendously warm. My mom hovered above me, holding a bottle of water. I had passed out. They never asked me to go back in. In fact, they never asked me to go to the funeral. And the rest of the cars drove off, with little flags in their windows. Our car drove home. My father procured an ice pack, and I got in bed. I, I couldn't sleep. The memory of the dead body and what it said to me would come to me in my dreams. Every now and then. By day, I'd forget it. I'd forget that it ever happened well enough. Simply accept that my brain had betrayed me. At night, it was harder. Still, for years, I continued on and lived my life, blessedly free from the touch of death. And then one of my friends died. We were playing basketball at the local gym. I'm not a particularly blessed athlete, but I can hit a two or a three and given up the ball easily enough. So I'm always welcome on the court. My friends John, Lewis, and I were playing a game of three on three with some fellow gym rats. Lewis, all six feet, five inches of him, was our low postman, banging bodies down in the paint, where John and I handled the ball up top. I dribbled down my opponents as best I could, but couldn't generate any space. I turned to my left to pass the ball to John and watched him die. As soon as the ball left my hands, I could see it happen. I didn't know why. John didn't clutch his chest or scream, he just simply fell. The ball sailed harmlessly over his head as he hit the ground. I rushed over to John on the hardwood, and I fell to his side. He was on his back, his mouth open, his eyes closed. My hands hovered over his lifeless form, not knowing what to touch or how to fix. Finally, I picked up his limp head off the ground and positioned it towards me. His eyes were closed, but I could feel them find me. His mouth opened slightly, and he delivered a concise, articulate message. We're supposed to be in this together. We found out later that John had died almost immediately from a massive cardiac event. Something was wrong with his heart, and the basketball game provided just enough kindling to the fire to set it aflame. Everyone agreed that he had died swiftly and painlessly. The damage was so complete that he had died before he hit the floor. I never asked anyone else if they had heard his message, and I somehow knew they wouldn't have. I attended the wake, but stayed on the back. I didn't want to hear what this corpse had to say. I already heard it before. No one seemed to mind. They could see that I was traumatized. And traumatized, I stayed for weeks. I locked myself in my room, and I rarely came out. My brain and I had reached an understanding that it was, it was not lying to me. The dead were speaking to me, but I didn't know what they meant. The phrase, we're supposed to be in this together, rattled around in my head day and night. My dreams were no longer populated by just my grandmother and John's corpse, but all of them, all the bodies that used to be people, but were now 
chatty driftwood. As I retreated further and further into the land of the dead, my mother would occasionally call me or visit me. She could tell something dark was happening inside of me, but didn't know what exactly. I don't blame her then for keeping bad news from me for as long as she could, but eventually she had to share. On one of the recent visits, her eyes were red and puffy and was crying. My other grandmother, my sole remaining grandparent, had a brain tumor. It was terminal. I supported my mom as best I could, as her grandmother was her mom. In the back of my head, however, I knew this just meant there would be another afternoon of one-sided dialogue with the dead. The prospect of another wake terrified me. I was able to get out of seeing John's body for a second time because I had already seen it once. But this was my grandmother. This was my family. There'd be another wake soon, and I would have to do the deathly shuffle back up to the coffin to say my goodbyes. And this time... I'd be expected not to pass out. My grandmother still had some time left, so I resolved myself to be prepared. I needed another wake to attend, a practice wake, if you will. The dead had spoken to me twice, and maybe the third, they would have something new to say. If not, I'd at least be more used to the phenomena and be able to hold myself together when my grandmother expired and uttered her final message. If not, I would at least be more used to the phenomena and be able to hold myself together when my grandma's expired lips uttered their final message. I googled obituary, which led me to my local newspaper's obituary page. One of the first entries was James Zanderfield, the 59-year-old father of four. His viewing hours were tomorrow at the same funeral home my first grandmother's body had been in. The next day I arrived back at the funeral home, dark suit, frown affixed tightly. I exited my car and strode through the doors confidently. I gave my well wishes to the woman in the back. I said I was one of James's co-workers, that we all loved him. I would miss him tremendously. I stuck out a bit as one of the only few Caucasian mourners. Still, there was a mostly big, diverse crowd. Mr. Zanderfield had clearly been beloved. I got in line to approach the casket, and after a bit of a wait, I was in front of what was once James Zanderfield. His dark skin was as still and implacable as my grandmother's white skin had been. I stood and waited, staring down at the corpse. Get it over with, I whispered under my breath. The body immediately obliged, its tongue fell out of the limits of its lips and teeth. I know it's hard with the wires, I said. Just say it. Once again, the corpse complied. We're supposed to be in this together. I closed my eyes and I leaned back, nodding. There it was. This was something that just happened to me now, a part of me accepting the situation. The other part of me felt frustration beginning to mount. What does that mean? I asked simply and softly. James's face lay still and silent, and I stared at it again, willing it to twitch, willing it to speak. What does it mean? I asked again. Still nothing. Softness. Silence. From a corpse. What does it mean, James? I hadn't realized I yelled. But I had. I had gasps and hushed whispers all around me. I turned around and saw wide-eyed mourners scattered around the wooden chairs. Uh, I'm, um, I'm sorry for your loss. I muttered, and I walked from the coffin straight to the door. It was colder outside than I remembered. I felt a chill despite my black jacket. The air was as quiet and oppressive as the death chamber had been. From the front porch, I gazed down the hill of the funeral home's property to the road below. The funeral home sat right between the intersection of two roads at an angle. In this part of the country, most roads are at an angle. There's no right or left turns, just rightish and leftish. But this intersection had always been particularly beguiling. I watched as a man in a suit as dark as mine exited the sidewalk and braved the non-existent crosswalk to get to a small dirt parking lot on the other side. Suddenly a car emerged from around the corner to my right. It was moving fast. Too fast. I couldn't see the plate, but surely this was an out-of-towner who didn't know there was a stop sign just past the tree line corner. The collision didn't happen in slow motion like they sometimes say. 
The movements were quick and abrupt, like stop-motion animation. The car hit the man, and the man took to the air. I saw his body take flight in stations, first an inch above the hood of the car, then shoulder level, then the roof, finally flipping and twirling like a marionette high above where the car once was. The body fell back to the cracked gray pavement from a great height. Just as my feet once took me to the edge of the casket, they now took me out into the street. I walked down the hill, careful not to stumble in the grass or the rock outcropping them at the sidewalk. The man in the dark suit sat on the ground, one arm slumped over his chest, the other splayed out, matching his left leg's unnatural angle. Without thinking, I knelt down beside the body and got a closer look. His face was speckled with dirt, gravel, and debris. There was a thin crimson line across the top of his close-cropped hair. His eyes were closed. I gazed at him for what felt like an hour. I was as still as James's corpse inside, waiting to see the twitch, waiting for the mouth to move, unencumbered by wires or threads that may have later sewn them shut. I silently urged for the mouth to speak, to say the words, to get them over with, but the man on the ground didn't speak. Carefully, I reached down and I pressed two fingers to his neck. They felt a weak, unsteady beat. I was the first one to make it down to the pavement, but now I could feel the people gathering around me. I turned around to meet them. You! I said to a man in a tan suit behind me. Call 911! You! I said to the woman next to me. Head down the road! Find the driver! Make sure they don't go anywhere! Then I proclaimed to the small group behind them. One of you get in your car, create a roadblock at the corner, and make sure no one else makes it through! I don't know where the words came from. But they arrived all the same. My orders having been delivered, I turned my attention back to the bleeding man on the ground. He seemed as though he could he could have been one of James's Xanderfield's sons or nephews. He appeared stocky in his ill-fitted suit. Perhaps that was just because of the angle of his body. I took off my black coat and began tearing at it. No, don't move him, I thought. They always say not to move someone after an accident. Once the sleeve of my coat was free, I gently applied it to the top of the man's head. I could see a dark shadow of blood begin to stain it. I applied more pressure with my left hand. His leg and hip were likely shattered. There's nothing I could do about that. Instead, I looked for more punctures. Sure enough, his red shirt was beginning to grow redder on the lower side of his stomach. I lifted up his shirt to see a gaping, oozing wound. My right hand pressed into it with the remainder of my coat. Suddenly, the man grumbled and slowly moved his head. I gently kept the sleeve placed with my soggy left hand. Um... Am I alive? He muttered. Yes, I said. You've been in a car accident, but you're alive. His eyes opened now, blinking against the twilight sun. How do you know? He guessed. How do you know I'm alive? Because I talk to the dead. I know what they say, and you haven't said it yet. The man nodded, as though that made all the sense in the world. I removed my right hand from the bloody mess. He gently picked up his left hand from his chest. You're going to be okay, I said. The ambulance is on his way. I don't know how I knew he was going to be out of it okay. But I did. He's going to live through this. Thank you for helping me, the man said. Of course. We're all in this together. We're supposed to be in this together. The ambulance arrived moments later and whisked the man away. The people who I had delegated tasks to had done their jobs. I found out that the man on the ground was James Xanderfield's son, Jimmy. I received news the next day that Jimmy was going to live despite a shattered pelvis, broken leg, and brutal concussion. My grandmother died two weeks later. Her body didn't say anything at the wake. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I wanted to say thank you for watching tonight's video. If you guys really liked today's video, feel free to check me out at patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. A bunch of you already did, like Tacia Lynn, Gino Baga Arneo, Eric Mary, Daniel Paulson, Trace Miles, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Wayne Milstead, Ken Lando Higuchi, Brianna Ventine Jensen, Nicholas Said El Yassin, Buddy Burrows, Tyler Ramberg, Goonington, G. Weevil 3, Diane Krauss, Asia, Gabrielle DeBaca, The Red Oak Shield Virus, 
Sandy Barney, Melissa Swagart, Chopinski, Daniel Rao, The Ginger Bros, Robert Ramirez, Andrew Stenberg, Holy Realm, Ralph Rodriguez, and Dr. Strawberry. A very special thank you to you guys for being the top supporters on Patreon. And honestly, any support at all is really appreciated. So if you're watching on YouTube, listening to the podcast on Spotify, Apple, iTunes, or Google Play, or I guess anywhere you can manage to find a podcast, a huge thank you to you guys as well. Oh, also, if you want to help support my wife, she runs a tea shop over on Etsy, etsy.com slash ivorymonocle. She actually does Dungeons and Dragons themed stuff, but she just started doing a Final Fantasy and Harry Potter tea set, so that might be something you'd like on a dark and stormy night. Sweet dreams, kids.